Welcome to online worship with Epiphany Lutheran Church on this 15th Sunday after Pentecost, where we hear in the gospel lesson, Jesus continue his teaching on forgiveness with his disciples. A bulletin for this worship service is downloadable from the front page of our website, but we try to include all of the lyrics to the hymns and the uh, spoken parts of this liturgy on the screen for you. Today in the life of our church would normally be God's Work, Our Hands Sunday, also known as Rally Day. Uh, we are thankful for the donations that people brought in for the ACTS House. ACTS is a ministry here in the greater Richmond area, uh, which we support, that helps to prevent uh, the issue of homelessness. And so we received these household goods and we have we will be delivering them to Acts Ministry this week. That was our God's Work, Our Hands project this year. Um, I can say that we will begin one adult Sunday school class next Sunday, September 20th, led by one of our members. It will be on the book of Galatians. Uh, members will receive a link for this Zoom Bible study in their email next week. If you would like to participate in that Bible study, come by the church and pick up one of the books on Galatians that they will be using for that. Also, our Faith Formation Ministry team members are getting uh, together uh, Faith Formation Sunday School on the Go boxes for families to use over the next several weeks. Those will be prepared soon as well. Be on the lookout for our mystery hymn word of the week, which means the following day or the near future. So our mystery hymn word, which is contained in one of our main hymns, the following day or the near future. Our worship continues with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We, we turn, turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who cry out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, sisters and brothers.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis, the 50th chapter. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord.
Moses and your works to the children of Israel. Lord, you are full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You will not always accuse us, nor will you keep your anger forever. You have not dealt with us according to our sins, nor repaid us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is your steadfast love for those who fear you. for his children, so you have compassion for those who fear you, O Lord. The second reading is found in Romans 14. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave his debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! 
I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, friends, and welcome to our children's sermon time. I'd invite you to just come on up and to have a seat on the floor if you like. Together we'll sing. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King. In what you hear, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Have you ever had your feelings hurt? Maybe somebody said something to you that wasn't very nice. Or they called you a name. Or they had something that you want, but they wouldn't share it with you. Or they left you out of a game that they were playing. We all do get our feelings hurt. But if somebody comes to us and says that they've done something wrong and they ask us to forgive them and give them a new start, would we want to do that? Would we want to start over? Well, that's the life that Jesus teaches us about. Starting over with people um, and forgiving one another. To forgive somebody just means to say, what you've done, I'm just going to look past it. And we're going to continue to be friends and we'll have a new start together. One time, because Jesus was always talking about forgiveness, one time, one of his disciples named Peter said, he got to thinking about it. And he said, but how many times, Lord, how many times should I forgive somebody if they really hurt me? Should I forgive them seven times? That would be a lot of times to forgive somebody if they really hurt you. And Jesus says, not just seven times, but 77 times. Can you count that high? Can you imagine how many times it would be to forgive somebody who really hurt you? I I have a hard time imagining how many times that really is. But if you were to stack up something like these books, 77 high, do you think it would be a very big stack? It would be a pretty big stack, don't you think? Well, the answer is 77 is a lot. In fact, it's so many that I couldn't get it all in the frame and it fell over one time when I was trying to put it up. 77 is a lot of times to forgive somebody who has really, really hurt you. But you know, God gives us forgiveness. God forgives you and God forgives me through Jesus on the cross, and God gives us the power and the ability to forgive one another. Because Jesus is alive, and because Jesus walks with us and loves us, we can forgive each other, and we do have a new start every day. God loves you so much. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for loving us, for forgiving us, and for helping us forgive one another. Give us a new start in school and at home and in all of our relationships. And help us remember how much you love us. In your name we pray. 
。アーメン Life in the Martin House, my house, right now, is a life of constant learning of rules and breaking of rules and doling out consequences and saying sorry. I'll spare you the details, and more importantly, I'll spare my family the embarrassment, but with a four-year-old and two middle schoolers, daily life involves a rolling tally of screen time overages and debates about who left which crumbs on the kitchen table and didn't clean them up, and whether or not certain people are allowed in certain people's bedrooms without knocking. And that doesn't even include the issues of living with me. They have a rap sheet on me a mile long. Do you know that I've never loaded the dishwasher correctly? Not even once? I'm serious. It's not just a matter of opinion. I'm really bad at it, and I have to confess, I don't try to get better. A lot of other stuff goes on in our house, of course, to be sure. Eating, petting the puppy, watching episodes of Friends. But when I step back and look at the whole picture, that's really the crux of it in our household. At our best, most of what's going on is forgiveness and compassion. Thanks be to God. And isn't that the case with every family, every identifiable group of people? That's the one thing I've loved about the videos from the Holderness family, especially during this pandemic. The Holderness family is this relatively normal family of four who post regularly on social media in a very lighthearted but honest way about their lives, usually with music, airing some grievances with one another and showcasing what their household is like. A great many of their videos reveal how living as one community is really about constant negotiation. It's about constantly fessing up, acknowledging your shortcomings, and then showing grace, usually with humor. The story we have of Joseph in the book of Genesis, of course, is this on a grand scale. It is an epic story of constant negotiations around mistakes of the past and family trauma and cold-heartedness. 
It goes way, way beyond who leaves crumbs on the kitchen table. It's got favoritism, human trafficking, fake death, lying, all kinds of sordid drama I don't have time to go into today. But in the end, a part of which we hear today, forgiveness and reconciliation rule the day. Joseph is miraculously able to overcome all of his bitterness, all of his pain, all of his anger after being sold into slavery by his brothers, and he's able to receive them once again in love. It's such an emotional scene and so complex. Joseph hears the words of his father whom he loved and who loved him a bit too much. It provokes compassion and joy in Joseph. And then there's this culminating scene where Joseph weeps in front of them. And then they're all like, I'm not crying, you're crying. And they present themselves as slaves at Joseph's feet. But Joseph doesn't want that. He wants his brothers back, not slaves. And somehow, Joseph is able to see in all that has happened the hand of God leading them back to one another, restoring them as a family. There are many things Joseph's story teaches us, things that even the Holderness family touch on. One of the main points is that a family can only function if no one is keeping constant track of wrongs. Forgiveness has to wipe the slate clean on occasion. Openness towards reconciliation needs to be present all the time, like a default position on a computer program, like oxygen. Otherwise, it kind of stops being family or community. It becomes chaos. I think this is largely what Jesus means when he explains to Peter and the other disciples that they are to forgive people not seven times, but 77 times. Jesus doesn't literally mean to tally how many times you forgive someone for sinning and stop at 77. He's being flippant with the number, turning the question back on Peter in a humorous way. 77 was kind of a way of saying, don't count occasions of rule breaking and forgiving because forgiveness isn't really able to be calculated. It's like he's saying, be constantly gracious. Don't ignore wrongdoings by any means or the pain they cause, but be aware, always be aware, of your ability to unburden people from their trespasses. Don't be a Karen all the time, pointing out everyone's flaws in an unrelenting manner. Relationships are living and active, and just as individuals need daily bread to survive, so do we need forgiveness and grace and mercy to make it each and every day. It's not just a matter of being nice and thoughtful. It's a matter of giving people oxygen. Then Jesus tells this fantastic parable to remind his disciples that they too have been forgiven. It's not just a one-way street. Our default stance of grace towards other people is based on God's grace towards us. We have been loved and forgiven 77 million times. Again, We're not supposed to count. The parable tells the story of a slave who owes an exorbitant amount of money to his king. 10,000 talents may not mean anything to you or me, but historians say that this would have been equivalent in Jesus' time to about 200,000 years' worth of wages. Scholars tell us that not even King Herod would have had that much in his treasury. How this slave ran up that kind of bill, we are not supposed to be too concerned about. The point would be that there's no way he could ever pay it off. When the king makes preparations to sell him and his family, the slave falls down in humility and begs for time to pay it off. And instead of getting a deadline extension, which is what he asks for, he gets complete forgiveness of the debt. The king just lets him go. But then this slave immediately turns around and comes across a buddy who owes him a much smaller amount. A hundred denarii was equal to about four months of wages, so a very doable debt. He grabs the guy by the throat and demands the money. Well, what happens when you grab a person by the throat? You cut off their oxygen. 
The guy pleads and pleads just in the same manner the first slave had done, but instead of being merciful, instead of canceling the debt, he throws the poor guy in prison. Word gets back to the king about this, and I suppose that most kings probably wouldn't really get involved in many of their slaves' private financial matters. I suppose most kings really wouldn't care about who owed who money or who was doing what to which person. I suppose most kings would have bigger fish to fry, but this isn't most kings. This king doesn't want this kind of stuff going on in his kingdom. This king has a higher vision for how things roll, and he finds that unmerciful slave and calls him wicked, throws him in jail, and has him tortured until he pays the 200,000 years worth of wages. And the bit about the torture may freak us out a bit, because torture is terrible and inhuman. But on some level, we end up truly torturing ourselves when we withhold forgiveness and shut the door on true reconciliation. I think that's what Joseph understood. Receiving back his brothers only as slaves would have just prolonged the torture of everything he'd been through. Doing the hard, often emotional work of listening and restoration frees the person who does it almost, if not more, than those who are forgiven. I came across an article recently about the infants and children of Nicolae Ceausescu's Romania from the 1980s. In one of the most heartbreaking and disgusting eras of human history, Nicolae Ceausescu, the Romanian dictator, ordered hundreds of thousands of children to be born to appease his fascist fantasies. But because the country was too poor to raise them all in homes, many were placed in orphanages where they rarely received any physical or nurturing care. They would cry and no one would comfort them. They would get scared and no one would hold them. They wouldn't be able to fall asleep and no one would rock them. Tragically, we now know this did irreparable damage to the way their brains processed fear and hope and the world around them. And now many of them are adults, which is what the article was about. And they're unable to function at a normal level in society. They find it difficult to build healthy relationships with other people. It's such an awful thing to ponder and talk about because... It still happens on a smaller scale today, here and there. But here's what it teaches us. Humans, even at birth, it turns out, are able to process mercy and grace. We begin our lives as creatures that receive, receive care, receive warmth, receive joy and security. We do nothing to deserve it, but our survival depends on it. And the survival of others depends on our willingness to share it. It is oxygen for God's people. And God started it all rolling in Jesus, his son, that different kind of king who gives up everything, who gets thrown in prison, who gets tortured to death in order to keep that cycle of forgiveness and reconciliation going. We never outgrow this. We never outgrow the need to hear and know we are set free from the brokenness that burdens us. We never get too old to receive the news that our debts against God have been canceled across the board. It makes us live, and we just receive it. Sometimes I look online and at the news, especially as we near a presidential election, and think, We're all just holding each other by the throat. How dare you think that, Trump supporter? How dare you support that, Black Lives Matter activist? And we lay into each other primarily to get a pound of flesh and inflict a mortal wound on the other side because how could they, right? And we want to deprive them of oxygen. Perhaps it sounds a bit idealistic, but maybe it's time to stand back And think of the human family, especially think about that meme we want to post before we post it, or that news station we want to turn on, or that comment we want to make. Maybe Jesus tells us this parable again right now in hopes we would realize we've been given to one another as brothers and sisters. And maybe 
We might hear in this lesson the fact our whole existence is dependent on the grace given to us by God through other people. Certainly, we don't ignore the wrongs we've inflicted on one another. Certainly, we take seriously the real damage that lasts, but certainly it's time to remember for the love of God that our default position as forgiven and loved children of God is not attack and torture, but listen and embrace. Our default position is grace because that's what God has lavished on us. As Paul says to the Romans, we do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. My decisions don't just impact me. I'm bound to you and you are bound to that guy over there. Like Joseph and his brothers, we are the Lord's, whether we live or whether we die. And his is the hidden hand of God leading us back to one another. Are we the Holderness family? Nah, but we're the holding us family. For God holds us in his care and his steadfast love forever, never repaying us according to our iniquities, holding us from the moment we're born, seeking love and warmth to the moment we die and find eternal love receives us. Seventy-seven times. Not that we're supposed to count. Thanks be to God. We are God's people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended, he descended to the, the dead. dead. On, On the third day, day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. O God, you welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold us and your church throughout the world and make us a place and people of welcome, reaching out in compassion, grace, and forgiveness to this world which you love. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where our human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you for healing, renewal, and redemption for your world. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom especially elected leaders and community leaders and all school administrators, teachers, and staff. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Bring healing and justice wherever there is need. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. Be with all those who are affected by COVID-19 pandemic, wildfires, or economic difficulties. Be with those near and dear to us, especially Jeff, Carol, Peggy, Stuart, Teresa, and Bill at the death of his mother. Give us your peace and healing. 
our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Teach us to forgive as you forgive, and remind us that you do not always accuse us or hold our past offenses against us. Silence our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over our opinions and make our congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Bless us during this ongoing season with growth in your word and in your grace. Strengthen our faith through Bible studies and Sunday school to-go boxes, confirmation classes and youth group gatherings. Nurture new ministries of education and service and teach us to trust your loving kindness. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that we set upon of saints who taught us how to bow our knees to you in worship, and for the tongues that taught us to praise you with our voices and lives. Keep all those in your eternal care until we all join them to see you face to face. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, in the name of the Spirit, the three in one, the three in one. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Lift his countenance upon you. Lift his countenance upon you. God's blessing go with you. God's blessing go with you. And give you peace. And give you peace.
Go in peace to walk the journey, worship the Christ, and witness with joy.